Okay. Welcome everyone to a new jam session within our machine learning needs mathematical optimization online seminar series. We are very pleased to be back and to see many participants today. And as always, we are going to have three speakers and all the questions will be asked at the end. But if you have some urgent matter, you can write it in the chat. Our first speaker is Chen Peng from Stony Brook University, and he's going to talk about factor model of mixtures. So all yours, Chen. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can. Mm, can you see the can you see the slides? Yes, we do. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Chen from Stony Brook University. Um, glad to be here today to present the work with my uh, advisor, Stan Wigaset. Um, so the motivation for this uh, work is simple. We want to estimate the entire conditional distribution of a response variable y given factor x. Now, to be more specific, uh, we would like this method to be uh, very easy to optimize. Uh, preferably, it should be uh, the parameter estimation can be done by convex optimization. So that uh, kind of excludes neural networks in general. Uh, but at the same time, we want this method to give us the entire conditional distribution <clears throat> in a flexible way. So we cannot just do uh, some regression with a parametric formulation for the residual. Um, so let me uh, quickly introduce uh, two methods that kind of inspires our work, uh, the latent class regression and uh, quantile regression. The model formulation uh, of our method is uh, analogous to the latent class regression, while the parameter estimation uh, draws inspiration from a quantile regression. So, well, to add a point before, before I introduce this model. So we would also like to focus on, on discriminative methods, which means that we don't want to uh, estimate the joint distribution of uh, y and x, and then obtain the conditional distribution. All right, so among all the methods left, so let me introduce two uh, classic ones. So the latent class uh, regression basically models the conditional distribution of y given x as a Gaussian mixture distribution, where the mean standard deviation and weights are uh, functions of the factors x. Of course, at the, at the, uh, <laughs> in the original paper, it's not so complicated. Some of them, some of these functions are linear or, uh, or just constant. Um, it's very flexible. We know a Gaussian uh, mixture uh, has a very good approximation uh, ability. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, uh, the parameter estimation is non-convex problem, and it has to be done by some advanced algorithm like EM algorithm, and we want to avoid that uh, for in our model. Uh, another thing, another method, uh, quantile regression. Uh, the, mod, uh, the problem formulation here looks like, uh, it kind of looks like uh, least square regression. Instead, the error here is the uh, pinball loss which is a piecewise uh, linear function. So by choosing uh, probability, or we can call it maybe confidence level P, and then minimize the residual or, or the error of the residual, we obtain a model for the conditional quantiles. Now, since we have to choose a P, it looks reasonable to vary this P from zero to one, because it's, it's the confidence level for the quantile, uh, and obtain all of the uh, conditional quantile models. And in this way, it looks like we can get uh, the entire uh, conditional quantile. But uh, one problem is that, of course, we cannot do all of them, only a limited number. So we don't have a smooth function. The other problem is called um, quantile crossing. So if we just do all these quantile regressions separately, and we will see that the quantile curves at some point would cross uh, each other. And this violates the definition of quantile because we know that from if we order, if we have uh, point 0.1 to point 0.9 quantile models, then at a fixed point one, for example, here one, 
the quantile should be monotonically uh, ordered, uh, but there's no guarantee for that. So this is a problem. Uh, of course, people have been trying to solve this problem using, for example, rearrangement or uh, using adding hard constraints in the joint optimization. Uh, we want to uh, achieve this uh, non-crossing uh, by just by design. Uh, it, the model should rule out this uh, problem. Okay, so here's how we formulate our model. So the, here is the, the, the P quantile of the, uh, the, the P conditional quantile of the responsible variable Y conditioned on factor X is a weighted sum of the, of some basis quantile functions Q sub I. Now, it indeed looks like uh, the latent class regression, but we are not modeling the density. Instead, we are modeling the quantile function. Here, A are just some unknown parameters to estimate. So here's our model formulation. Um, and uh, let's also, let me talk about the parameter estimation. So this draws inspiration from, uh, from quantile regression. So we first, for a fixed P, define uh, uh, define the residual here L, and then we minimize the a weighted sum. Like if this is a discrete version, then we can we minimize a weighted sum of all the all of this uh, all the um, conquer process error or pin, like a pinball loss of this of the residual uh, for all p. So it's kind of like we are doing all quantile regressions in one shot and uh, obtain a conditional quantile model. Now, uh, I guess one thing, let me go back a little bit. One thing to say here is that just by formulating this model doesn't achieve the goal that I stated at the beginning. We want, like, we need some specifications for this Q sub i and P sub i to make sure that, for example, it's a it, it's a valid quantile model. It, it aka it's a um, it's non-decreasing and doesn't have quantile crossing problem as a function of p. Um, now, as for the parameter estimation problem, we also need to specify specify the family of q sub i and p sub i to make sure that this is a convex optimization problem. Just by doing this is not enough because um, well, although this error function is convex, this uh, residual might not be a convex function with respect to the unknown parameters a sub i. So we need some specification for them. Uh, now, here, let me. Just, well, one thing before before I go into the specification of these functions, let me quickly mention an equivalent formulation to this uh, parameter estimation problem. So this continuous ranked probability score is uh, is the uh, L two distance between two uh, CDF, which is the inverse of quantile function. So here F is a CDF, and one here one is a, a step function, but it can be viewed as the CDF for one data point. So this score function, uh, it's often used as a metric. To, uh, to assess the quality of um, distribution of forecasts. So here F is the forecast and one here X is the data. And the sum of CRPS is a, a score for to, uh, to measure the quality of the forecast. Uh, an interesting equ equivalent formulation for the CRPS is using quantile function, here the inverse of CDF, the quantile function, and the pinball loss from the quantile regression. So it, now with this equivalent formulation, it looks really similar to the problem statement that we had in the last page. So in fact, just by doing the a joint quantile regression, uh, we are actually minimizing the in-sample CRPS. So this is an equivalent formulation. All right, uh, let me talk, let's talk about the, uh, families of Q sub i and P sub I, B sub i that we can choose. Now it's quite general. So one thing we want to guarantee is that uh, this function G, which is the, the P 
uh, p quantile of responsible variable y conditioned on factor x, we want this function to be non-decreasing in p for all x. And that's what we call non, that's what is required by a non-quantile non crossing model. Now to achieve this, uh, a sufficient condition is to require q sub i to be uh, non-decreasing and b sub i to be to be non-negative. Uh, now there are really a lot of choice we can we have. For example, for non-negative function, we can use neural networks with a non-negative output or non-negative kernels, some some classic parametric functions, and uh, some non-parametric function like beast points. Here's just to look at what these points look like. Now, for uh, so with these functions, we achieve the. Oh, here is we have non-negative p sub i, and also need a non-decreasing q sub i. Uh, but just if all these q sub i's has an analytic uh, expression, then any of these function will give us an analytic expression of conditional quantile function because. With these functions, with this non-negative p sub i's, this uh, this outputs a number, and we have a weighted sum of some basis quantile function q sub i. So it has there is an analytic correction for the conditional quantile function. But for q sub i, we also need to specify some families. One possible choice is uh, the quantile function of some common distributions like, for example, normal, ex the quantile function is normal, exponential, or plus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other choice we can use is the monotone splice, which is uh, the integrated B splice. Uh, this is just uh, a visualization for that. Uh, well, here, let me show some very simple examples of the model. Well, uh, you can see that this, some simple models like location scale model and homoscedastic linear model, and also some simple dynamic models can be, they are, they are included in the, this uh, very general model formulation. Um, they have been, have been studied extensively. Uh, one thing is uh, to mention is that uh, we are, for these models, we are not using maximum likelihood or any other mass estimation method. We are, we are using uh, the joint quantile regression to estimate these simple models under our framework. Now, for a little bit uh, more specific uh, model, so suppose we use splice as the function b sub i, then it's a linear combination of some basis spline function. So that's how we end up with this formulation. And from this formulation, it's clear that if we uh, fix, if we fix p and focus this fun focus on xk this uh, function becomes a spline quantile function and if we fix uh if we fix x and vary p and this function is a mixture quantile and more importantly for parameter estimation this whole function is a lean is linear with with respect to the unknown parameters uh, a so that's why when we put it in a joint quantile regression, we have a convex optimization problem. So now we indeed achieve the goals that we stated at the beginning. So we have the entire conditional distribution. It's a smooth a quantile function. And we can model nonlinear heteroscedastic relation. And we have an analytic expression for the conditional quantile function. And the parameter estimation can be done by convex optimization. Let me uh, give a example to visualize what this model looks like. So here are just, here are some examples, some uh, splines, and here are some basis functions, a quantile, a basis quantile functions. Here's normal, exponential, and exponential distribution on the other, on the other side, because it's only one-sided distribution. Now, here's what this model uh, looks like. So if we fix P at a certain probability or confidence level and vary x, we obtain uh, a, a surface. Like when x is two-dimensional and y is a scalar, we obtain a quantile surface. 
And here are three quantile surfaces with uh, with uh, 0.9 and 0.5 and 0.1 probability. So they don't cross each other, but at the same time, they are able to model uh, very uh, nonlinear uh, relations. Um, if we fix uh, p and sorry, if we fix a uh, factor x and vary p, we can and visualize the shape of the conditional quantile function. As we can see, this this function is very flexible in in both the body and the shape of the body and tail of the uh, quantile function. And of course, this uh, flexibility uh, depends on the uh, function class uh, Q sub i and P sub i we choose. All right, here are some references. I guess that's uh, all I have for today. Thank you, Chen. Very nice presentation. Mm -hmm. And our next speaker is Haufen Sang from Columbia University, and he's going to talk about estimate then optimize versus integrated estimation optimization versus sample average approximation, a, st a stochastic dominance perspective. So all yours, Haufen. Okay, I think he's trying to connect again. Hello? Hi. Yeah, we hear you. Hello? Hi, Could you hear, we hear you. Me? Yes, oh, okay. yes, perfectly. Oh, okay. Then can you can you see my screen now? Hello? I um, think it is loading, but I cannot see it. Thomas, can you see it? Uh Yes, I can see it. Okay, so it's oh. my problem. Okay, so you can start half and thank you. Okay, so is it good now? Uh, okay. I... It's not full screen, but uh, we can see the PowerPoint. Really? I, I already... Um... Let, me, let, me, let me try. Is it is it full screen now? And uh, no. Not for me, at least. Uh, it's weird. Mm. Uh, is it is it better now? Yes. Oh, okay. I can see uh, everything now. Okay, okay. It, it is a full screen, right? Yes. Okay. So, so I, I'll start. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hao Hong Zhang, a PhD student in the IEOR department at Columbia University. So today, I'm going to talk about comparisons among three mainstream approaches for data-driven optimization. So this is joint work with my advisors, Adam and Henry, as well as our collaborator, Yufan. 
So in data-driven stochastic optimization, a decision maker aims to optimize a cost function that involves some random outcomes, where the randomness can only be observed from data. Uh, moreover, in data-driven contextual uh, optimization, data consists of response and its uh, associated contextual information. So in this work, we particularly look at data-driven optimization with nonlinear objectives, which appear widely in many real-world applications. Here are three examples. Okay, so in news vendor problem, uh, the goal is to minimize the expected cost by choosing some suitable inventory levels where the product demand is randomly distributed. The constraint in this problem could be uh, the capacity of the inventory levels. So the demand may also depend on some contextual information such as prices, uh, weather, or economical indicators. So other examples include portfolio optimization problems and electricity scheduling problems. There are two key ingredients to um, solving uh, data-driven optimization. That is, in addition to the optimization step, we need to estimate uh, the randomness by incorporating data information. So uh, how to handle the estimation step leads to uh, different approaches, particularly the following three mainstream approaches that I will discuss today. Sample average approximation is a well-known approach, approach that directly uses empirical distribution. Uh, other direction is to use statistical inference. We can first feed the distribution using data and then solve the uh, stochastic optimization using this fitted distribution which we call estimate the optimize. We can also uh, filter distribution using both data information and the information from the downstream optimization problem, which we call integrated estimation optimization. So previous research in this area focuses on how to uh, design algorithms or demonstrate their general effectiveness. However, direct statistical comparison among uh, different approaches are not well investigated in literature. So in this work, we address this fundamental question. Uh, we create a principled framework to statistically compare different approaches, which appear uh, to be the first result in the nonlinear objective setting. Okay, we can see the uh, general data-driven optimization of the following form. We have a known nonlinear cost function. C, uh, for instance, C is uh, the following form in the news vendor problem. Our goal is to minimize the expectation of C. So this function C depends on a decision W as well as a random object Z. The distribution of the random object Z is unknown in data driven optimization. Instead, we only have access to data zi that are iid joined from the uh, ground truth distribution p. In this form, we let w star denote the target optimal decision. This form can also be generalized to the uh, following form. First is the constraint case, where we have some deterministic constraint on the decision. Uh, this could consist of some known uh, functions gj on w. So gjw is less than zero, let's say. Uh, second uh, generalization is the contextual case where we have additional contextual information called x that affects the distribution of z. So given x, z is conditionally distributed according to an unknown ground truth distribution p z given x. In this problem, we, uh, we do not know what this p z given x is. Instead, uh, we only have access to data x i z i that are i i d joined from the uh, distribution, uh, from the joint distribution of x and z. Okay. So in this talk, I will mostly discuss our results for this uh, standard form without context and constraint, which facilitates understanding and highlights our most important ideas. So with additional efforts, our results can also be generalized to 
uh, constrained optimization or contextual optimization. You can find them in our paper. Let me uh, give you some intuition for solving this problem. So if the this data distribution P is known, then this problem is the classical stochastic optimization. So if P is unknown, then we uh, we need to estimate it. We, we may estimate directly by the empirical distribution. So this is the uh, essentially the sample average approximation. Our alternative approach is to infer it via a parametric approach uh, that, that is widely used in statistics. We will uh, see the, uh, so th this approach will have some advantage in the contextual case. So to be specific, we first construct a family of distribution P theta for P where well, theta is the parameter. For instance, this could be a, a, a family of multivariate Gaussian distribution, where well, theta is the mean vector and the uh, covariance matrix. Then uh, we can see the class of oracle problems. For each theta, we obtain W theta as the optimal solution for minimizing the expected cost under this uh, artificial distribution P theta. So intuitively speaking, if P theta is a good approximation of P, the ground truth distribution, uh, then we can expect that the W theta is also a good approximation of W star. Therefore, uh, using this parametric approach, we aim to find a good theta in this oracle. Okay. So next, we can next uh, we formally define the three approaches considered in this work. The first one is uh, the sample average approximation. So this is the most straightforward approach. We use the empirical distribution from the data as the estimation of the ground truth distribution. Then the resulting optimization problem becomes the sample average of the cost function. We call this solution WSAA. We consider two additional algorithms based on the parametric approach that I just discussed. We want to obtain the parameter theta in the above uh, in this uh, oracle problem. So the second approach is called estimate and optimize. In this approach, the first step is to estimate the distribution from the, da from the data, where theta is obtained by the maximum likelihood estimation. Here, the lowercase p theta is the PDF or PMF. The second step is to optimize the cost under the estimated distribution. We use p theta ETO as an estimation of p, plug it into the Oracle problem, and that W theta ETO is the ETO solution. So in this approach, um, the first step only uses the data, which is completely independent of the optimization problem. The third approach is called integrated estimation and optimization. So this approach estimates theta by leveraging both data and the information from the optimization problem. It selects the model, model parameter theta that uh, by the oracle problem give rise to the decision with the best empirical average cost. Then with that WIO be W theta IO as the IO solution. Okay. So our task in this work is to answer a fundamental question about which approach provides the best performance. And let's discuss some previous literature. Recently, there have been a number of papers that propose various approaches for data-driven optimization, such as the SPO framework for contextual linear optimization and the conditional IEO framework for contextual nonlinear optimization with discrete distribution. So uh, they mainly focus on developing the algorithm or demonstrating their general effectiveness as different papers adopt very different settings, statistical comparisons among uh, different papers are not, are not very clear. To our knowledge, there are three studies that are related to ours. The first paper here uh, compares ETO against IEO for contextual linear optimization, where the expected cost can be separated into the decision and the mean response of the context. Uh, this probability does not hold for general nonlinear optimization. So this is a fundamental difference between contextual linear optimization and contextual nonlinear optimization. The second paper shows that SAA achieves the smallest regret asymptotically compared with 
some distribution of robust optimization approaches in the sense of second order stochastic domains. This paper focuses on uh, non-linear optimization and it does not involve the detailed comparison among the covariance appearing in our analysis. The third paper is about operational statistics or operational data analytics, which uh, has a similar spirit to the IEO approach. They can see the specific optimization problems instead of our general uh, problem. And their method is in a small sample region, where uh, the comparison in our work is in the asymptotic region. Okay, let's dig into some technical detail. To evaluate the performance of a solution, we use the following criteria. The regret or optimality gap of a decision W is the difference between the ground truth expected cost of W and W star. Obviously, the lower the regret is, the better the decision is. Because data-driven systems are random depending on the data, uh, the regret for data-driven solutions are also random. Therefore, we need a way to compare two regret distributions one way is only compare the mean of the regret distribution, which is indeed adopted in some uh, previous research. Here, we are able to do something much better. We use a type of stochastic ordering called first order stochastic dominance to compare the distribution. We say that X is first order stochastically dominated by Y if any tail probability of X is less than the tail probability of Y. Importantly, this definition is equivalent to the property that any increasing function of uh, for any increasing function, phi, the expectation of phi x is less than the expectation of phi y. When x and y are both non-negative, it implies that any moment of x is less than the moment of y. Therefore, this is a very strong comparison. The goal of this work is to compare the regret of the three solutions uh, from SAA, ETO, and IEO in data-rich environment when the sample size n goes to infinity. Our results can be summarized as follows. In the mean specified case, meaning that P is not in the parametric family P theta, then SAA has the smallest regret, while ETO has the largest regret, asymptotically in the first order stochastic dominant sense. However, interestingly, if in the well-specified case, meaning that P is indeed in the parametric family P theta, then the performance ordering among three approaches is completely reversed. Okay. Let me let me show you uh, let me show you my, our results more rigorously in the next slide. Okay. So again, so the first theorem says that when the model is misspecified, as n goes to infinity, the regret of WSAA converges to the minimum value zero because there's no model or model misspecification in SAA. But the regret of WETO converges to a value that is larger than the one that uh, WIEO will converge. So this is also easy to see because uh, by the construction, IEO will ultimately identify the theta that has the minimum expected cost among all the parameters. Therefore, uh, this parameter found by the IEO should be at least as good as the one in ETO. Therefore, in this case, SAA is the best approach, while ETO is the worst case, uh, is the worst approach. We remarked that, that this inequality is not a strict inequality. It is possible that some of them are equal. And in that case, we can borrow results from the uh, real specified case. Okay, interestingly, our previous finding is completely reversed when the model is well specified. Uh, this uh, is actually our main contribution, main technical contribution. It shows that under some mild assumptions, such as the first order and second order optimality conditions, uh, the asymptotic regrets of all three approaches are zero, and they all converge at the rate one over n. Uh, so, so therefore, you cannot distinguish them uh, based on the first point here. The second point here says that the asymptotic behaviors of n times the regret are different from each other. So in fact, n times the regret converge to a certain limiting distribution for all three approaches called GETO, GIEO, and GSAA. They have the following relation. GETO is uh, first order stochastically dominated by GIEO, and GIEO is first order stochastically dominated by GSAA. So 
Oh, okay. With um, with some additional technical efforts, these results also hold in the constraint optimization and contextual optimization. Okay, let, let, let's discuss our result. First, our result provides a strong comparison among the three approaches in the first order stochastic dominant sense. It implies the relation on any moments, including the mean. And in fact, uh, it is even stronger than that. Second, our results are in the asymptotic sense as the sample size n goes to infinity. But we will also see in our experiments that the same trend holds in the reasonable finite sample regime. Moreover, since the integrated approach has demonstrated its empirical power in uh, recent research, our result seems to provide an opposite view to the common belief, showing that ETO could be better than IO. We caution that this finding also uh, Sorry, uh, this finding only holds uh, in the well-specified model. In practice, um, it could be very hard to construct a well-specified model. And sometimes the model simply cannot be rich enough to be well-specified. In that case, our first theorem shows that IEO is better than ETO. This might explain why IEO is likely to perform better in practice. Okay, finally, let's look at some numerical results for a multi-product news vendor problem. This figure shows unconstrained uh, constrained, uh, the contextual use vendor problems. We observe that in all settings, ETO achieved the smallest regret in the well-specified case and has the largest regret in the mean-specified case. This is consistent with our theory. Although our theoretical results are in the asymptotic sense, our ex uh, experiments shows that the same trend also holds in a reasonable finite sample region. To conclude, in this work, we create a principle framework to statistically compare different approaches, asymptotically in the strong sense of first order stochastic dominance of the regret. Our results are the first in the nonlinear objective setting. In the future, we are interested uh, in the following directions. In the finite sample regime, we need to balance the error appearing in the zeroth order regret and the first order regret, taking into account the degree of model misspecification. The second is to study procedures that can address the distribution of shift or uncertainty in the data. So here is the paper link. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Hafen. It was a great presentation. And our final speaker is Julia Di Teodoro from Sapienza University of Rome. And she's going to talk about unboxing three ensembles for interpretability, a hierarchical visualization tool, and a multivariate optimal table tree. So I'm going to prepare your content, Julia. Thank you. All yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Giulia Di Teodoro, and today I'm going to present this work uh, um, that I made in collaboration with my colleague Marta Monaci and Professor Laura Palaggi. The, okay, the, this is a brief uh, table of content. Uh, we are going to see why interpretability is important, and then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, VIRE, that is a, a trivial uh, visualization tool that we developed to understand what is happening inside the tree ensembles and meet it. That is the surrogate model that we developed for, in, uh, developed for interpreting tree ensemble models. So, so interpretability is important uh, because uh, uh, machine learning model have an impact on real world implications uh, and the understanding their inner workings is important to gain uh, insight in the how they do their predictions and to ensure ethical and responsible use. But nowadays, the most powerful classification methods uh, achieve high levels of accuracy at the expense of a lower interpretability. That's why interpret in, in interpretable model needs to be developed. Um. Uh, in uh, about the tree ensembles, uh, several tools and methods in literature have been uh, uh, developed for interpreting tree ensembles model, uh, such as internal processing, which include methods that aim to provide a global overview of the model through how to measure helpful in interpreting the results obtained, like uh, uh, mean decrease accuracy of uh, uh, Brayman or mere mean decrease impurity and so on. And then there are post-talk approaches. 
which aim to identify our relationship structure among response and predictors. Uh, among these approaches, there are rule extraction, local explainability, and size reduction of the forest. Our approach falls in this last uh, stream, uh, in particular in the stream of the born again tree. Uh, that is, uh, we aim to construct uh, a single representer tree that can mimic the behavior of the pre-existing tree ensembles. Uh, our approach so wants to explain um, a tree ensemble model behavior and at the same time uh, maintaining interpretability. To have this interpretability, a limitation must be imposed, uh, like the um, in, in constructing, in building this, uh, this single tree, like few branching rules and few features used in each uh, of these branching rules. Uh, to uh, start uh, um, to well, the, the aim, so in general, of what we develop it is to uh, make a tree ensemble model interpretable because uh, decision, a single decision tree are high interpretable uh, because they are based on a Boolean logic, but they often overfit and they do not have a good uh, out of sample predictive capabilities. While tree ensemble models um, regain uh, the, um, a more powerful predictive and generalization capabilities, uh, putting together the prediction of different uh, uh, single decision trees, but became a, a black box model in this way. For this reason, uh, the first uh, things that we mm, tried to do was to understand how features are used inside the, the trees of the forest. Uh, and then uh, um, we um, use this, this information in our uh, rebuilt uh, tray. Uh, but while we were analyzing how to use, uh, uh, how to, to features are used within the forest, uh, we decided to develop this uh, uh, trivial uh, hierarchical visualization tool, but th that can be useful to have a glimpse, a, a fast view on uh, uh, how um, features usage levels uh, uh, impact their importance in the tree ensemble model. As a matter of fact, we develop this uh, representation that use uh, either the frequency of usage of feature at different levels or the feature frequency at a specific node. And the idea um, is based on the notion that features appear that appear some more frequently at the nodes closer to the root are likely to play a significant role in prediction outcome, more than the, than the features that appear uh, in, uh, in, um, in deeper uh, lever, levels of the tree. So uh, in this representation, we mm, simply created a, this heat map set that uh, show the feature frequency usage at each lever or at each node across the trees of, uh, of the forest. And this is uh, an example of an application of this visualization uh, in the Cleveland data set. Uh, that is a UG uh, machine learning uh, toy data set uh, for classification. As you can see, for example, here it can be seen um, uh, fast, very fast that uh, the feature tal is used 66% uh, of the time at the uh, depth zero. And that does imply that probably it is one of the most, if not the most important feature in the, in the set of features. The same uh, representation can be developed uh, using the feature frequency per, per node. Uh, so, uh, this information of the feature, feature frequency was also used uh, in the MIRET, that is the, this server gate model that we developed. In particular, the idea was to replace uh, a tree ensemble classifier with a newly constructed single tree that can reproduce in some sense the behavior of the tree ensemble. So uh, based on this target tree ensemble that we want to interpret, uh, we presented a mixed integer linear programming formulation uh, uh, for learning a multivariate interpretable rebuilt tree. 
with the same maximum depth of, uh, of the forest, of the trees of the forest, and that accounts for information derived from the target tree ensemble. In particular, we use the, the formulation of an optimal tree. Um, what is an optimal tree? Uh, basically, it is an holistic view uh, to the problem of finding a tree that can satisfy a global optimality criteria. So that is not optimized in a greedy fashion, but uh, uh, all at once. Uh, it, it is possible thanks to um, the advance, advances in mixed integer programming uh, that happened in the last 30 years which generated a speed up over a million of times of uh, off the shelf solvers like Ciplex or Gurabi. Uh, so in uh, 2017, uh, Bursimason then proposed the formulation of the optimal classification tree problem as a mixed integer optimization model. Uh, that uh, has the possibility to account for uh, complex uh, splitting rules, that is oblique splits, to manage the trade-off between complexity and training error and include other constraints on the rules. So basically the objective of uh, an optimal classification tree is to minimize the total misclassification cost and to manage the complexity of the tree and the number of features used ac across the splits. In this tree, uh, nodes uh, are divided into branch uh, nodes and leaf nodes. In the branch nodes, uh, a hyperplane split is applied using only one feature in the case of uh, univariate uh, splitting or uh, more than one feature in the multivariate case. And in the leaf node instead are nodes that assign uh, in their class label to each point into the leaf node. So Mirad is a, uh, take the, um, takes the uh, optimal uh, tree formulation and similar to the optimal trees, it uses oblique splits and it has a fixed depth uh, equal to the maximum depth of the trees in the, in the forest that we want to mimic. Uh, in a way that uh, uh, we can have a fixed complexity and we can prevent the model from growing excessively and losing interpretability. Uh, and uh, um, in addition uh, to the basic formulation of optimal tree, it accurately mimics uh, the ensemble classifier prediction, so have fidelity with respect to the tree ensemble that we want to mimic. It use feature frequency by level and use proximity measure among pairs of samples. Moreover, it accounts for um, out of sample prediction, that is uh, uh, the accuracy with respect to the ground, ground truth. So in the formulation, the constraints that uh, we put inside uh, um, were the assignment constraints, that is the set of constraints that forces each sample to be assigned to one and only one leaf node. The sparsity constraints that are modeled in order to enforce uh, uh, um, a feature to be used in a splitting rule only if that feature is, is also used inside the, the target the tree ensemble model. The rooting constraints uh, in a way that uh, every time a, a sample ends up in a node, then it must end up uh, in one of uh, the leaves of the subtree rooted at that node. And then we uh, incorporated uh, uh, other constraints uh, to incorporate uh, um, uh, the um, tree ensemble drive driven information. The information that we took from uh, the, the target tree ensemble we want to mimic uh, are the proximity measure. That is a measure referred to pair of samples uh, that represents the number of times uh, and this pair of samples appear together uh, in the same leaf uh, um, across the, the trees of the forest. And uh, we used this uh, proximity measure in the constraints. Uh, in particular, we define the set of pair of points uh, with a proximity measure over a given threshold and added the proximity constraint uh, as a hard constraint for that point uh, that uh, ended up in, the, in, this, uh, in this set of points. 
Uh, then we use the class probability, that is the highest estimated probability of the prediction given by the trend sample. And in particular, we used this uh, information in the objective function that we are going to see in a while. And then there is the level frequency, uh, that is the frequency that we depicted in the VTA representation that we used both in constraints and the objective function. Uh, in particular, in the constraints, uh, we use the level, level frequency to force the model to select uh, at a level D only features uh, in the subset of features used uh, uh, more than a given frequency uh, inside the, the target trend sample we want to mimic. So in the objective function, we created this objective function uh, uh, to maximize the fidelity to the trend sample. Uh, so uh, the function has to measure the errors that the, the tree makes with respect to the trend sample. Uh, then we penalized more the error on samples, pre samples predicted with high probability by the trend sample. Uh, so we used the, the, the probability of uh, the, sam uh, the predicted probability uh, by the, the, the target trend sample to weight misclassification in this way. And then uh, we promote the use of sparse hyperplane to enhance interpretability in a way that uh, uh, the selection of each feature is penalized according to the level frequency with which they are used in each level. As a matter of fact, uh, we weighted at each uh, feature uh, with this factor, uh, one divided by the frequency. Uh, so this is the resulting objective function. Uh, with alpha, that is a penalty hyperparameter to control the trade-off between uh, fidelity uh, with respect to the trend sample prediction and sparsity of the features to not lose interpretability. And the, we can say that the pro of uh, MIRET is the compact formulation, uh, but also uh, the fact that a global solution can be found by an exact algorithm and uh, the possibility to explicitly both model the trade-off measure training error and black city and uh, including feature reductions. But the cons are that uh, uh, the modeling uh, uh, disjunctive reading constraints uh, can lead to numerical issues and the, uh, as um, much as the number of features uh, and points uh, on the data they said increase, uh, uh, higher um, uh, mixed integer optimization difficulty uh, can, uh, can, uh, can, can we can have in the, in the solution of the problem. Uh, then we uh, tried to improve also the formulation. We added a other constraint to improve the formulation uh, to uh, restrict uh, the, feasible, uh, the, the feasible uh, space uh, of, of solutions. And in particular, uh, we uh, put uh, this constraint uh, to um, avoid dummy trees, uh, that is to uh, enforce the existence of at least one split then we uh, added this constraint to break symmetries, at, um, where symmetries are solutions that have the same value of the objective function, but differ in the values of integer values. And then we added branching rules with Boolean variables, uh, variables through which we um, written the, uh, the, uh, the, the assignment, assignment constraints uh, um, had been rewritten and the parenting constraints were added in this way. So we conducted a, a computational experience on 10 different UCHI machine learning repository related to binary classification tasks. And uh, we use it as a target tree ensemble, a random forest classifier for this experiment uh, with maximum depth uh, of two, three, or four, and with number of trees uh, in the forest uh, equal to 100. And uh, the KPI that we report in the results are the fidelity with, uh, between the um, random forest and the optimal tree, and the accuracy both of uh, mid at rebuild three and uh, the random forest. So comparing the mid at basic formulation with respect to its improved version, uh, 
uh, we can see that the improved version helped to uh, close the MIP gap uh, uh, more often uh, and uh, certifying the optimal solution or uh, help to reach uh, a smaller gap uh, in a, a smaller amount of time. So it is um, it is um, um, the improved version of the formulation. It's uh, helping in uh, uh, the optimization. This is uh, the predictive performance that we obtain it uh, divided by depth two, three, and four. And as you can see, the fidelity with respect to the um, uh, the target trend sample uh, is uh, quite high, uh, and uh, also the accuracy of Miret uh, with respect to the accuracy of the random forest is uh, is maintained, more or less. Uh, we can also see that Miret induced uh, uh, future sparsity as we as we want it, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, if you see the random forest uh, across the trees of the of the forest use much more feature with with respect to the feature used by by the mirrored formulation and here i reported uh, an example uh, of the mirrored tree when it is applied uh, to interpret uh, the random forest on cleveland database and as you can see um, uh, the maximum depth is three, but only uh, depth, um, two are splitting rules. So two depths are used uh, for reinterpreting, uh, for rebuilding the the, the tree, uh, having the same uh, um, fidel, uh, the same accuracy on the ground through it, and a high fidelity to the prediction of the random forest. And this is an example of applying the mirror um, when an extreme gradient boosting is trained in a real world the, uh, diabetes database to predict the onset of diabetic retinopathy. And this is reported to um, uh, let you see as uh, this uh, tree can also create uh, an easy uh, tree uh, to follow um, in a medical application. Uh, 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 underlining which are the features that most okay, that contribute the, uh, mostly uh, in a given prediction and uh, with uh, which threshold basically. So that's everything. Uh, if you want to read our paper, um, it is it is it has been published at the beginning of this year in our journal on computational optimization. And if you have any question, then I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very nice presentation. Uh, presentation. Uh, we now open up to questions from the audience uh, to any three of our speakers. So if you have a question, please write in the chat or raise your hand and we'll give you access to the microphone and camera. And it does seem we have a question in the chat. Um, See, Caroline, if I can give you access. Yes, Caroline, you should have access to the microphone now. Oh, OK. So it's for you, uh, Julia. How does your approach compare to other born again tree methods in terms of performance, accuracy, runtime, et cetera? You can also see it in the, in the chat. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I'm reading it in the in the chat right now. Uh, basically, the objective uh, of our model with respect to the, the one of Vidal are different uh, because Vidal tried to rebuild one tree, one, one tree, a single tree that uh, um, should have the same uh, spatial uh, partition of the space uh, with respect to the random forest uh, that uh, um, the, 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 the trees mimic. While in our case, uh, we are also allow, um, making the tree able to use a multivariate um, hyperplane split. So basically, the partition of the space is different, and we want uh, and we don't want to uh, mimic the um, uh, to reproduce the the same um, 
uh, function that random forest learned, but also but only to have uh, uh, the same predictive capability. So the division of the space could be could be different. So the objective is a little bit different. Uh, moreover, um, I remember that in the Vidal approach, uh, the there is no uh, fixed depth. So um, basically, sometimes to uh, replicate the, exa um, the exact same partition of the space, uh, the um, the depth of the tree uh, grows. Uh, uh, very fast, uh, but in our case, uh, if the depth is um, wouldn't be fixed, uh, um, the interpretability would have been lost in some in some way. So we we also fix the complexity. So the um, probably the runtime is not really uh, is not really comparable in this in this sense. Um, so we didn't report the the comparison in the in the, in the paper, uh, neither for um, for this reason because we we thought about this a lot, but basically they are not comparable since the objective is different. Thank you to you for the thank question. you. And it seems we have another question from Paula. Is that right? Yes, please. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So my question or comment is to Sheng Peng, the first speaker. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. This is very interesting work, which we'll, we'll look into a bit more detail. Um, if I understood well your uh, data, the data to which you are fitting the regression model is classical data. And I mean, one one real observation per, per unit. And you wish to have a model that obtains all quantile functions at a time. Uh, I'd like just to make you aware of work we have done some years ago already with Sonia Diaz, which was uh, also online. Um, which was the designing a regression model where you obtain a full quantile function as output on data that are also distributions. That is um, a regression model for histogram value data. So you assume that you have quantile functions which are piecewise linear, both uh, for the independent and the dependent variable. And the model allows obtain the full quantile function for the dependent variable as output. And I'll be happy to share the reference and any comments you you may wish. Oh, that would be great. I would definitely want. I would like to check it out. But when you say uh, you model the indi both the independent and dependent variable, like is that a a generative model where you model the joint distribution or? Well, both the, for both the explicative and the dependent variable, we have not just one observation, but mm -hmm. a distribution for each unit, okay? And this uh, empirical distribution for each unit and each variable is represented as a standard histogram. But to build the regression model, we use the associate quantile function, which is piecewise linear. So we obtain a regression model, which is a linear combination of piecewise linear functions to obtain a piecewise linear quantile function of the dependent variable. I see. Uh, could and you share the, the paper in, sure. a, in the sure. chat? Or to... And then, and then uh, there is some um, approach with that does not impose non-negative coefficients, which is, of course, an issue, and you have this issue as well. <laughs> Okay, so I'll be, okay. I, I can share the reference in the in the chat now. Okay. Otherwise, I think I can find your email easily and send you the the reference. Okay, okay great. I will check it out. So, so this is um, there, and I, if I can get you the doi, uh, I don't know if I can. This is uh, published in Statistical Analysis and Data Mining uh, in two thousand fifteen. Mm -hmm. And now you have in the chat the title and the DOI. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Otherwise, and good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? No, I think that's it. Thank you so much to our three speakers. And we are back with the regular seminar in two weeks, so on the 22nd. And thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.